You know, Brad was talking uh, earlier this evening about meeting people that you have never met before. Um, sometimes that leads to a serendipitous moment. And I want to start tonight telling you about my serendipitous moment, because it was exactly a, one particular moment in my life. I was uh, going into my senior year at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Go Badgers! <laughs> and uh, I was... Uh, I had been working my way through school, and I thought, I just have to get out of Wisconsin and see something else. I got my backpack on, went to Europe. And I was wandering through London, uh, my first stop, and I saw this poster for a lecture on satellites. The year was 1966. In case any of you were alive then, and if you weren't, it was a long time ago. Um, and you know, I don't know too many 20-year-olds that would have said, oh boy, I'm going to go and see the, hear this lecture on satellites, I'm going to go in. But I thought it was, wow, this could be something. Because, wow, I thought Sputnik, when I was a kid, was just like frightening and exciting at the same time. And uh, then President Kennedy decided to challenge us to put a man on the moon, and so I guess I was always in outer space anyway. I went in, and I heard the most amazing lecture. It was a lecture about geosynchronous orbiting satellites, 22,300 miles above the Earth. And only three satellites had to be positioned at different places around the globe to communicate all around the globe. Now, to understand how profound that was at the time, you have to take away all your communications tools today. Take away your cell phone, your, your internet, your fax machine, your, take away all 5,000 cable television channels take away everything and know how barren the landscape was. It was only three broadcast networks at that time and one hardline telephone, probably in most homes. And this idea of using satellites to communicate around the world, don't forget, we had the Berlin Wall and the Great Wall of China. They were communists behind those walls. We were in the Cold War. It was, we didn't know what was behind those walls. And I thought, wow, we could get behind those walls. We could figure out what those people are like. We could do a lot of different things. And by the way, the lecturer was Arthur C. Clarke, well-known science fiction writer and also scientist who wrote about geosynchronous orbiting satellites coming out of the Second World War, and this was 20 years later, that we finally got them launched. I walked out of that, and that was an idea that would never let me go. I couldn't get it out of my mind how powerful these satellites were, so I diverted my track from possibly going to medical school, which was where I was headed, and went into satellites. And um, wrote a master's thesis on satellite technology, and worked for seven more years to be in the television business, the satellite business and the cable television business, waiting for the next moment that could electrify my career. And it came seven years later. It came on a magical night in 1975. September 30th, 1975. I wonder if anybody in this room knew, knows what happened. September 30th, 1975. Well, it's the night that changed the course of television history. And what night was that? It was the night that in the cable industry, we brought, there wasn't really much of a cable industry back then, but people who were trying to build it out brought live from Manila the greatest championship boxing match, heavyweight boxing match of all time, Muhammad Ali against Joe Fraser, the third great matchup. We brought it live via satellite from Manila into Vero Beach, Florida, and demonstrated for about 150 people in the cable industry from Congress, people with, you know, interest in uh, the business, saw how powerful satellite transmission could be for transmitting television signals. And that is indeed the night that the industry realized that they could really energize a whole new program outlay 
by using satellites to connect. And cable at that time was only, you know, rural areas mostly. Uh, outside of major metropolitan areas, they were really virtually antenna systems. And that was the night that changed the course of television history. And that's the night that launched my career. Well, let me say, it was really great from there on out. I uh, went out and got the uh, t television rights for major sports. I uh, started with Madison Square Garden, 125 events from Madison Square Garden, and then rapidly brought in uh, all the other major league sports. The uh, Major League Baseball, by the way, go Cubs, right? <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, the NBA, the NHL, tennis, golf, uh, the Masters uh, from Augusta, Georgia, the U.S. Tennis Open, ever track and field, college sports. I had it all. Um, and it was really an exciting thing to do. Um, and I, I, um, I did that all before uh, ESPN. And as Brad said earlier, probably the most brilliant thing of it all was that we created a new business model, because at that time, there was only advertising for television support. And we reversed a model and collected a fee from the cable operators uh, to help pay for the programming. So created the two revenue streams that make all these program networks so successful today. And they're monstrous. And isn't the sports mon uh, business monstrous too? I mean, five years later, uh, when new owners uh, bought the company, it was timing Paramount and Universal, they weren't interested in sports, and I fought with them so hard for over a year to keep sports as a separate network from entertainment. And it was a battle, you know, you think when someone's really successful in the end, you look at it and say, oh, that was great, look at all those wonderful things they did, but nobody ever gets there without the battles. And that's one I lost. I lost that battle to keep all those sports. Um, and over the next four or five years, uh, the contracts I have were unwound. I mean, we lost them, they, um, we had to give them up because the Hollywood guys really wanted to go into more entertainment. I did a lot of great things in entertainment too, but you know, you look back at it and you say, ESPN today is, is by far the most valuable cable network out there. And um, so, you know, it's just one of those things, battle that you lost sometime. Uh, we all have those things as we're growing up for having success. But it was great. You know, it was a wonderful career. I, I loved it. I stayed in it for a couple decades, built out a great entertainment network, introduced a sci-fi channel, which I knew would have a great audience, went international, and after and quite a number of years, um, in the late 90s, when I was uh, getting ready to leave USA, uh, President Clinton had asked me to head the National Women's Business Council. And it's just a presidential appointment and to report to Congress. And to tell you the truth, it really didn't float my boat because as an entrepreneur, we like to build things. And I wanted to do something that would really be showing some results. So I looked around and I saw all this money pouring over the transom, $104 billion, and 1.7% of it went to women. And I said, somebody's got to change the picture on this poster. So I said to President Clinton, I would do it if I can use it as a platform to get women into private equity and get some real funding behind their businesses. What kinds of businesses would those be? There'd be technology businesses, they'd be life science businesses, sciences, businesses that require significant capital uh, to go to market. So I went off to Silicon Valley, because that's the mecca of venture capital, um, and talked to some people. I was on the Oracle board at the time, and uh, talked to a number of people I knew out there, and some said, oh great, we'll try to help you find some women who really have great companies that maybe Venture would support. And the other half of the people said, don't you dare come here. You're gonna get laughed out of town. They aren't gonna be good enough. And I said, well, I'm gonna see. You know, we're gonna go out and find out. So we did. And we were hoping maybe we'd find 100 applicants that would, maybe we could find 10 of those that would be good enough to present to venture capital. But you know what happened? 350 applications showed up. We were bowled over. I knew right then that this was an underfunded and potentially very overperforming marketplace. And that was in the year 2000. That January, we selected 26 of those companies to present in Silicon Valley. And I'll bet you that None of the 250 people who showed up to listen to them had ever seen a woman pitch a venture business to them because women just didn't get to do that in Silicon Valley. 
And the amazing thing was, 22 of them got funded. Two merged the business, one sold her business, and one wasn't funded. Thank you. I knew it was showtime when they stood up there on the stage, and I was so happy with the results. But you know what's happened since that time has even been greater, because I didn't know this was going to be my second startup. But 15 years later, we continue to identify these women entrepreneurs who are doing such a great job in technologies and life sciences, in particular, we focus on. And um, we've brought 600 companies uh, through our program now, uh, over about 6,000 that we've screened. It's a very uh, rigorous screening process that we go through. Uh, they go through a 12-week training program. They present at demo days, and we go out and help them raise venture capital. But much more than that, we've created a expert network of over a thousand people who are experts in every field of technology and every field of life sciences, biotech, devices, diagnostics, etc. You know some of these companies, I'll bet, that have come through this program. Zipcar, iRobot, famous for the Roomba vacuum cleaner, but also a defense contractor. Um, Constant Contact, Minute Clinic, some of the Biotech firms like Xenogen, Icogen, you might not know them if you're not in that business, but we've had, uh, out of the 600, 165 have had liquidity events for their investors already. They're doing great work for their investors, great for their employees, they're building wealth. It is so exciting to see these women do so well. We have new ones coming up, like Joan Fallon at Curemark. The, she'll be the first to market with a treatment for autism. And that is a fantastic breakthrough. Or Cynthia uh, Lozmazny, who's got a company called Madu Metal, who is going to upset the steel industry. She has a product in nanotechnology that is lighter, stronger, and less corrosive than steel. I mean, doing fabulous things. We started Fashion Tech Labs uh, last year in New York. Women coming through who are bringing technology to the fashion industry, and listening to Cynthia here just a few minutes ago, I, I really uh, realized that she dabbles a little bit in uh, funding some women, or some entrepreneurs, not necessarily women, um, in the fashion business. Well, we have great companies coming through now this fashion tech lab in New York. So there's all technology applied to all kinds of, of uh, businesses that we see. And you know what's really fabulous about doing something like this? I didn't know that this was going to be my second or third career or whatever, um, but it is a wonderful thing to be able to take my 40 years of experience in the business and share it with others and see the light go on when they find their vision, get their passion, understand the rigorous hard work that is going to take them some place with that business and help them get there. There's something very, very exhilarating about that. We started up in Australia and Israel as well. So we see people coming from other places around the world. It is very exciting to be an entrepreneur. I, I can't think of anything more exciting than to wake up every single day passionate about what you're going to do. So I think so often about how we live in a world of infinite possibilities. I look at what was available to us back when I started my career. We didn't have all these capital markets. We didn't have, you know, uh, the Silicon Valley wasn't back in, in the 66 uh, year. I don't even think it existed the way it does today at all. I mean, but we've all seen entrepreneurs throughout the centuries. Today, we have the best possibilities ever. I have to tell you that with our science advances, with our technology advances going faster and faster, sometimes we all feel a little bit lost in the shuffle of things changing so fast. But for me, I wake up every single day and I see nothing but possibilities. I hope that one of those visions will be yours, and the possibility will come true. Bless you.